Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be presenting our talk at the latest Open Data Science Conference in London. As a part of our vector search track, I was presenting vector search for data scientists. I really hope you find the talk interesting and a huge thank you to the Open Data Science Conference uh, committee and team for all sorts of things from guiding me through how to use the webinar software and generally accepting me to be a speaker at the conference. Thank you so much. This was such an exciting opportunity. And to everyone out there listening, I really hope you find this talk interesting. This presentation will explore the use of vector search for data scientists, including a case study with Twitter analytics. So we'll begin the presentation by looking at how I'm defining data science, vector search, and the Twitter analytics case study before diving into the details of linking these things together. So what are some common questions in data science? We typically have some kind of thing that we're observing, like the number of impressions that we're getting for our tweets or say views for YouTube videos. And we wanna look at questions like, how is my data distributed? Is it normally distributed, power law distributed? Are there particular outliers in my data? And then the third question that I really want everyone to focus on with this talk is the question of, are my variables correlated with each other? And trying to explore relationships between our variables and seeing how they impact the distribution of the thing that we're the most interested in. So say we're most interested in the distribution of impressions on our tweets. We also wanna look at variables like what time the tweet was sent, or whether the tweet contains a URL to try to see if that can give us some insight about the distribution of impressions on tweets. In vector search, we're looking at a new way of search where we represent objects with vector representations extracted from deep learning models. So the key questions are how well can we capture the semantics in vector representations and what can we learn about our data from the semantic clusters that are formed by these vector representations. So this tying these together, data science and vector search, is going to be done with the example of Twitter analytics. I've been um, making content on YouTube and Twitter for a, a while now, and I've been really interested in this kind of problem of trying to figure out the best way to do this messaging, uh, how to really kind of you know promote the, this content and make it successful. So I'm looking at my own Twitter analytics data to try to get a sense of if I can segment it using vector search to get a better sense of the distribution of the metrics I care about, like impressions or URL clicks, and see if there's any insights I can gain from applying vector search for data science and understanding Twitter performance. So if you're interested in performing this analysis yourself, uh, you can easily uh, go to the right top right corner of the Twitter analytics dashboard to download the CSV files. You can use the calendar icon to uh, download up to, I believe, four months of data. And then you can just, uh, you know, as this presentation will explain, you can easily upload it into Weaviate to enable these vector search functionalities. So the Twitter analytics, it'll give you this CSV data file where you have different columns like the raw uh, content of the tweet itself, as well as some features like what time the tweet was sent and the metrics that we're interested in, like impressions, engagements, engagement rate, retweets, replies, likes, user profile clicks or URL clicks. And the interesting, what the most interesting detail about applying vector search to this is understanding this idea of having semantic representations from the raw unstructured text itself, rather than approaches like feature engineering, where maybe we try to extract features like whether the tweet contains an emoji, what the character count is, word count, or if it contains certain keyword phrases like Weaviate or uh, deep learning and see what kind of segmentation we can do with those kinds of features that we manually engineer. So with that primer on how I'm looking at data science, how I'm defining vector search, and overall looking at this Twitter analytics problem, this presentation is segmented into five key sections. The first section is segmentation in data science, understanding how we split distributions based on other attributes. The second key takeaway is to understand vector representations of data. How do deep learning models produce vector representations of real world objects that capture the semantics in them? The third key topic is vector segmentation, using these vector representations to segment our data. The fourth key takeaway is this particular case study of using Weaviate for Twitter analytics and applying the intersection of the ideas in vector segmentation for Twitter analytics using the Weaviate vector search database. The fifth key takeaway are research questions and discussions about continuing this kind of research and expanding on the capability of vector search and its applications in things that data scientists care about. The first key idea is to understand the task of segmentation of analytics in data science. So in data science, we typically have a distribution of values of something that we care about. Now, for the example of Twitter analytics, I'm interested in the number of impressions that each of these tweets receive so that hopefully I can gain insights into what topics to tweet about, what particular language and uh, features like that that might lead to tweets that receive more impressions. 
So following the CSV export of the tweets, I plot my uh, impressions in a histogram and I can see the distribution of the impressions. So as I look at this, I see most of the tweets have, you know, in this kind of mid-level of impressions. And then we see some that go into having many impressions, although there are fewer of them. So, you know, we're just plotting the, the histogram bins of the number of impressions and then the count of how many tweets fall into each of these buckets. So when we have a distribution of this, the task of segmentation is to try to take apart this uh, visualization to see how it varies with respect to splitting it on certain features. So as examples of these features that we're splitting, we might ask questions like, what time was the tweet sent? Say we sent a tweet in the middle of the night, does that result in very low impressions? Or say we you know, sent our tweet right at 10 in the morning on Monday, uh, does that result in a successful tweet? Then we might ask, is there a URL link in the tweet? Does maybe trying to point people off of Twitter, is that you know, causing the Twitter algorithm to not promote our tweet or something like that? And that'll be our transition from understanding these splitting on these symbolic attributes compared to these vector attributes that are extracted from deep learning models for segmentation. So the first question I asked is, what time was the tweet sent? So from the tweets, I can extract this feature of tweets sent before 12, plot the impressions of those tweets, and then I can look at the impressions on tweets sent after 12. And kind of one of the problems with this is you see how the, the count is, there are much more tweets sent after 12 than before 12. It's difficult to kind of automatically extract some insight from that question. Similarly, we have the question of, is there a URL link in the tweet? And looking also at the distribution between these two values. So this is an example of splitting our data based on the symbolic attributes that are contained in the data, the, these kind of attributes like the time or extracting a Boolean value from the URL clicks. In this presentation, we're trying to see if we can split impressions or whatever metric we care about based on the semantics of the content itself and expand on segmentation from symbolic attributes to vector representations of the high dimensional objects that the metrics are describing. So the raw text of the tweet itself, or as we'll also look at when describing other examples, say uh, movie transcriptions, podcast transcriptions, uh, text in scientific paper, or images of e-commerce products, the, this kind of data that we can form vector representations from and then split our analytics based on the clusters in this vector space. So for example, without manually annotating the tweets, we can segment them based on their vector distance to the phrases WeV8 podcast, WeV8 tutorial, and AI weekly update to split the tweets based on uh, what they're about with, res with respect to these kinds of uh, categories without actually manually labeling them. We can similarly do this for say natural language processing, computer vision, or say robotics. We can use these kinds of distances to these query points to automatically form categories and clusters that we can use to split the impressions of the of the tweets. We perform segmentation to split the metric that we care about like impressions on tweets or say clicks on an ad and now what we want to do is see if we can segment these analytics based on the semantics of these high dimensional data objects like raw text, images, code even, audio, videos, uh, say graph structure, biological sequences, and really anything can be encoded into a vector representation like this. And then we form clusters of the vectors to segment our analytics and see how these clusters vary with respect to the metrics like impressions or views and so on. To summarize, the first pillar of the presentation is about understanding segmentation in data science. We visualize the distribution of our data to get a sense of it. So for example, we see that the impressions on these tweets are roughly normally distributed. And then we ask questions with respect to the features that we have, like, is this distribution also the case for tweets that are sent at, say, 3 in the morning? But now what we're looking at trying to do is say, what about tweets related to the, the topic of deep learning for robotics? And we're not going to determine that a tweet is about deep learning for robotics based on uh, keyword matching with, say, it contains the exact phrase robotics or deep learning for robotics. We're going to try to encode tweets into a vector space as well as the phrase deep learning for robotics and use the nearest neighbor search to determine tweets that have the semantic similarity with deep learning for robotics and then use this to get a sense of the Twitter impressions about on tweets that are about that particular topic of deep learning for robotics or similarly, say, uh, deep learning for biology or all these different kinds of topics that I've been exploring as I've been making content about topics in deep learning. The second key idea is to understand how we can represent real world objects with vector representations. So we'll start by kind of looking at different ways of encoding things, so to say. So looking at symbols compared to vectors. So some common symbols are 
uh, categories. So say we have uh, labels about vehicles and we have uh, ships, trucks, cars, motorcycles, and we use a one index to denote which category this particular thing is. So say this one indicates that this is a, an example of a car vehicle. So this is an example of how we represent uh, categories typically in these one hot encoded vectors. Similarly, we have variables like numeric values, like how old someone is, or uh, you know th these metrics are numeric values like impressions. These numeric values, we can use uh, thresholds like greater than, less than, and intervals to, to segment our data and get senses of it based on these numeric attributes. And similarly, we have Boolean values, true or false. Vectors are, say, n-dimensional objects where we have values in each index of the vector that that represents something. So this 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.34, this is a vector that uh, you would say it ha say has a, a direction, a magnitude, but usually we normalize these vectors so they all have a uniform magnitude, but it's really kind of the direction that is captured that it's hard to kind of reason about direction of these high dimensional vectors, but that's sort of what we're looking at when we're looking at comparing the distances between these vectors as we'll explain further in the presentation. So the key idea behind vector search is we're using these vectors to represent high dimensional uh, data objects that are otherwise really difficult to kind of compress into a single representation. And having this kind of flexibility with this n dimensional vector interface lets us store the semantics of the high dimensional objects. So say we take pictures like these high resolution images of golden retriever puppies and some computer vision model is say gonna uh, there are two things that generally we're looking at. Maybe the computer vision model is going to classify whether this is a dog or a cat. And before it makes that final binary prediction, it's going to have this latent representation of the dog at, say, layer 8 of the deep neural network. And then we're, then we're going to extract this vector representation to represent the puppy image overall and store it in our vector search database like what VV8 is. But another way of doing this that's uh, becoming more and more popular is to directly optimize for the vector representation itself. So as we'll explore further in, in this particular segment of the talk, we're looking at predicting these vector representations for the different images and trying to make, say, positive pairs like these two golden retriever puppies similar to each other and, say, dissimilar to other images like a brand new car image or something like that that would be different from these golden retriever puppies. So we'll return to the details of exactly how deep neural networks are producing vector representations, but let's stay a little further on what we're doing with these vectors once we have the vectors. So say we have some deep learning model that maps from images to vectors. Once we have these vectors, we can use vector distance to determine semantic similarity. So a common vector distance metric is L2 distance. You just loop through each index in the vector, and then you just square the difference of the two, sum that up, and that's the L2 distance. So say we have these three-dimensional vectors that describe this puppy, this puppy, and then let's pretend that there's an image of an airplane. So we would take the L2 distances between the two puppies and we see, you know, 4 minus 2 squared is 4 plus 1 squared 1 plus 1 squared 1 is 6. And then we'd also do the vector distance between the first puppy and the airplane. So the vector distance between the vector 4, 8, 10 and 1, 20, 20 is a much higher number than 6. So we determined that the first puppy is much more semantically similar to puppy 2 than the airplane based on this vector distance calculation. And there are a few different distance metrics that we can look at as we kind of mentioned uh, direction and vectors and say cosine distance, angular distance. There are a few ways of looking at distances with vectors, but generally it has this kind of form where you're comparing uh, indexes of the vector with each other. So with these kind of, kinds of vector distances, we can determine semantic similarity, but we can also cluster the vectors using say common clustering algorithms like uh, we could do things like k-means if it was in a lower, already in a low dimensional space, but Commonly we do things like TSNE, PCA, UMAP, projections from the 300 dimensions, say, into this three-dimensional space to get a visualization of, of our cluster. So we see how we have the chicken, the image of the chicken, the wolf, the dog, the cat. They're all kind of similar in the vector space, whereas they're dissimilar from, say, this Google and Apple logo or actual uh, Apple and then banana. So we see how we have these clusters in the semantic space. And so this is just the key idea to this presentation is understanding that we take a bunch of tweets from my Twitter analytics data and then we put them into this embedding space such that we have, say, the tweets about computer vision topics, the tweets about natural language processing topics. And then we can further look at and then we take the cluster out, extract the impressions data, URL clicks, 
And then we have a new interface for looking at the data science of seeing how these metrics are distributed. Before graduating from this slide, it may be worthwhile to stay a little more on this idea of why the talk is titled Vector Search for Data Science, say rather than Vector Clustering for Data Science. So when we have these clusters, it might not really be useful to just look at the cluster and imagine it's a cluster of like 500 objects or something like that. We want to kind of have semantic names for the clusters. So say we had done the search query animals and then animals takes us to this cluster of nearest neighbors. That interface for segmenting the analytics is, I think, more productive than just trying to just take the clusters and say do the k-means where you just have these clusters that are closer to these centroid points and then just doing your analytics from there. I think it's more useful to be remembering that vector search part of it where you have animals, uh, brands, or fruit and using those search query points to provide like a semantic title to the cluster. So to dig into this idea of vector representations of objects a little further, you might be interested in how these index positions influence uh, the representation of these objects. Can we say that, say, index zero solely determines how much of a brand, if we're saying these are, this is the brand cluster, does, say, index zero of this vector, is the density of that particular index determine how much this is that? And the, the thing about this is it's, it's a pretty interesting kind of field of research in deep learning, this idea of, say, disentangled representation learning, where we can say what each of these uh, index positions encodes and there's been some interesting research. Uh, multimodal neurons from OpenAI really stands out as an interesting exploration into these latent representations from deep learning models. But generally, we can't just uh, convert it from the vector representation right back into symbolic representations of what each index represents. Rather, we kind of have this uh, entanglement of the whole representation. And so we need to kind of rely on these vector distance calculations rather than kind of extracting, is this index, say, how much of a uh, fruit it is and so on. So another interesting question maybe is how much can we compress these vectors? And in my view, one of the most interesting things that we've done at Weviate is look at this binary passage retrieval idea where you can compress uh, the values in the indexes from say 32 floating point values to binary values, which is shown with this uh, green being one, white being zero to just kind of illustrate a binary vector. And surprisingly, you can still get impressive retrieval when you do this level of compression. And there are other ideas like uh, product quantization and, uh, say, locality-sensitive hashing that try to, say, compress the 384 part of it to uh, 32D. And one of the most rewarding experiences I've had at Weviate was to interview Eddie and Dillocker on his work in um, ANN benchmarks and benchmarking vector search at large scales and seeing how uh, computing these vector distance calculations using efficient data structures how that scales. So if you're interested in these kinds of questions like the performance of vector search and exact numbers for that with respect to how many vectors you have, the dimensionality of the vectors, and then kind of high level ideas like the distributions of the vectors themselves, you might be interested in checking out our WeVA podcast. So I hope that was a pretty clear overview of what we do with these vectors. So we have these vectors that are a particular kind of way of representing something. Uh, we convert from high dimensional unstructured data into vector representations. We have, say, vector distance calculations that form semantic clusters. Uh, we explore what's in these vectors and ask questions about how much we can compress them and how much, these, how much the performance varies with respect to the attributes of our data set and the vectors themselves. So now let's dive into the question of how did we get these vectors to begin with? So this is a very influential paper, sentence, birth, sentence embeddings using Siamese BERT networks that explains this idea of having Siamese twin tower networks where we have a copy of the same neural network that produces representation U and representation B. Uh, both of these BERT neural networks share the same uh, weights commonly. There are some frameworks where it's an exponential moving average and it's things like that, but generally it's a Siamese copy of the same network and they both produce vector representations of two different inputs. So sentence A goes through this copy of the network and sentence B goes through this other copy of the network. And now we compare the vector distance between the representation U and the representation V. And we have this loss function back propagate into the neural network weights of BERT on both sides to update the neural networks to produce better predictions for these two sentence A and sentence B. So the key thing is then determining, well, should sentence A and sentence B, are they positive pairs or negative pairs? Should they be uh, close in the vector distance space. So to give more of an example of this, we sample these points from data sets like Wikipedia. 
So often what we're doing is we're looking at heuristics to self-supervise the A and B positive or A and B negative scoring such that we can do this uh, representation alignment from internet scale data. And a lot of these, as we get into this idea of zero shot pre-trained models, they're trained on internet scale data such that they uh, have this amazing generalization property. So we start off with things like this query point. So here's an example of a paragraph from Wikipedia that describes the Miami Heat NBA basketball team. Now what we determine is that the positive pair is the next paragraph in the Wikipedia article. So now we led by Dwayne Wade and following a trade for former NBA MVP Shaquille O'Neal, this next paragraph continues to describe the Miami Heat basketball team. So we'd want to take these two paragraphs from Wikipedia and then encode them into a into vectors that minimize the semantic dis, uh, distance between these two, a vector distance between these two. And we'd also have negatives like this article about deep learning. So we would want to have a close semantic representation of these two paragraphs about the Miami Heat and then a dissimilar representation of this paragraph about deep learning. In addition to this idea of using heuristic labeling like saying that the following paragraph is going to be a positive pair of the uh, Wikipedia article, we also look at this noising or masking interface to form positive pairs. So data to vec is a very influential framework showing how we can do this positive pair construction for really any kind of data domain because this idea of applying a noise mask can generalize to any kind of data that you might have. So for example, we take an image, we apply this mask to it, uh, we have a speech file, audio file, and we apply this to it, language, mask out, width, and, and then try to align these two representations. So a couple of ways of looking at how we form these sentence A, sentence B, image A, image B, video A, video B, <laughs> any kind of thing for these two things that we're trying to encode into the vector spaces. So that's how we construct the optimization task, task to optimize the weights and thus optimize the vector representations of data. So as you're looking at this, you might be intimidated by this idea of, do we need to train our own models? Are we gonna to need to optimize a model with these contrastive learning loss functions in order to take advantage of vector search for data science? And what's the, one of the most exciting trends behind this whole thing is the answer to that is increasingly looking like no, and there are many pre-trained models that work well for a very broad range of data. So from being trained on Wikipedia or say uh, query passage pairs in the MS Marco data set, we're seeing that models trained on data sets like that are able to generalize and produce reasonable representations for say my Twitter data and things like that. So if you're interested in this, uh, Sentence Transformers from Hugging Face is an excellent place to get started on looking at these models that produce vector representations off the shelf for all kinds of data domains. To summarize, the second key takeaway from this presentation is to understand vector representations of data. Starting with what the vectors are themselves and understanding that we can take all sorts of things like images, text, or code snippets and map them into vectors with predictions from deep learning models. Those deep learning models are trained to maximize semantic similarity between, uh, between each of the positive pairs and they're usually trained on massive collections of data like all of Wikipedia or going even further for internet scale data like like on that kind of order and because they're trained on such a massive amount of data we often don't need to train the models ourselves for particular data domains to have a reasonable zero shot performance or a adaptation to our particular problem. The third key takeaway of the presentation is vector segmentation which brings together these ideas of segmentation and data science where we split the metric that we care about based on other attributes that we might have like what time we sent the tweet or whether the tweet has a URL link in it, and also this idea of vector representations of data. So to tying in these ideas together, we saw how we can uh, produce vector representations of text, images, code, audio, video, all sorts of uh, data can be produced into one of these vector representations through the inference of a deep learning model. And then we connected it to this Twitter example where uh, say we wanna split out the tweets based on the distance to Weavier podcast, Weavier tutorial, or AI weekly update to get a sense of how these things uh, cluster and how they're semantically related. So in this section, I'd like to maybe just quickly describe some additional examples in addition to the tweet categories. And I think hopefully we'll just kind of cement this idea of how we can apply uh, vector representations to segment analytics and apply vector search in data science. So we'll start with everyone's favorite task of house hunting. Houses in databases like these real estate platforms, they typically have symbols like the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, 
uh, square feet, these would be uh, numeric values, and then say we have cities that we might represent as a uh, categorical feature or something like that. So we have you know these kinds of symbols that we could split the houses. Say we want to split the prices of houses and we want to use these attributes like the number of bedrooms, or the number of bathrooms to split the distribution of the prices of houses. Well, with these vector representations, we can have vectors that encode the visual aesthetic of the house, say the neighborhood structure, and this is in that idea of graph structured representations, which kind of at the bottom of the list is graph structured embeddings. You see things like graph neural networks or algorithms like deep walk and node to vec. This idea of converting graph structure into vector representations as well is also something we can, we can do and is becoming increasingly easier to do as well. So we can encode the graph structure of the neighborhoods. And then we also just have a more flexible interface to define features with text. So compared to symbols where say we have a feature that is a pool, does it have a pool, one or zero Boolean value? Whereas with text, we can just kind of describe the features of the house in this flexible interface and then encode it in the vector representation that can encode all these things and then segment things like the prices of houses based on visual style or neighborhood characteristics that help us segment the houses by going deeper into meaning and semantics of what makes makes up these real world objects of houses. So similarly with e-commerce products, we have symbols like what kind of e-commerce product it is, like if it's apparel particularly, we might have shoes, t-shirt, pants, or say colors, whereas with vectors, we could have a representation of the visual style of, of the products themselves. Uh, with movies, we also have genre symbols like children, action, or sci-fi where vectors can encode, say, take a description of the movie, maybe reviews of the movie, to encode things like the themes, characters, storylines, these particular kinds of nuances that make movies different from one another within genres and without requiring heavy manual symbolic tagging. Uh, in scientific papers, I think, is one of the most interesting things to explore with this as well, where, say, symbols separate papers like that are related to biology or machine learning, whereas vectors can really encode the nuance of the ideas contained in the papers and maybe the writing style as well. And then finally with music, I think is another very interesting thing where uh, we have these high level tags like hip hop or dance, but vectors can encode sort of the musical style and I'm not an expert on music, but things like this could be encoded with vector representations using this kind of way of thinking. So hopefully these examples helped further clarify this idea of how vector representations what vector representations can help us capture in our data to uh, segment it and better understand it. And hopefully going through this list maybe made it more clear how to apply this to your own data sets. So we'll end this section on vector segmentation with the following quote uh, from Francois Chalet in his book, The Second Edition of Deep Learning with Python. That's the magic of deep learning, turning meaning into vectors, then into geometric spaces, and then incrementally learning complex geometric transformations that map one space to another. All you need are spaces of sufficiently high dimensionality in order to capture the full scope of the relationships found in the original data. So there's a little more to this quote than just uh, turning meaning into vectors, describing how we have uh, several layers of this kind of uh, tensor space processing and these nonlinear transformations between each space to the next space as you uh, pass through a sequential neural network. But the key idea in what we're interested in is this idea of turning meaning into vectors and the magic of deep learning and being able to do so and do so for so many different data modalities and use cases. To summarize, section three brings together the ideas of the first takeaway in segmentation and data science and the second takeaway of understanding vector representations of data. So vector representations, which are also, the, also commonly called embeddings, enable an interface to split analytics based on the semantics of the content itself. And this content could be text, images, code, audio, videos. It's really up to your imagination to thinking about what you're gonna encode in these vector spaces. So now that we've gone through the background of what segmentation in data science is and how we can use vector representations to facilitate with segmentation, I'm super excited to show this example of Twitter analytics mining with the Wev8 vector search engine and how we can use vector segmentation in Twitter analytics through Wev8. So as shown previously with the export CSV, Twitter analytics gives you a CSV data set like this, where you get the, uh, the text of the tweets themselves, as well as the time the tweet was sent and then the metrics like impressions, engagements, and so on. So in this example, we're gonna be using the text column to vectorize it with a sentence transformer. And then we're gonna use this for nearest neighbor search 
to segment the content of our tweets, such as whether it's about the WeVA podcast, t coding tutorials, or topics like natural language processing, computer vision, maybe even research niches like self-supervised learning or data augmentation, and so on to get a sense of how the semantics of this different content segments the impressions or URL clicks and these kinds of ideas. So following this schema that you see in this picture, this is how we upload this into WeVA through Python. So in Python, we create this dictionary where we have classes and then we name our class tweet. We describe the class tweet analytics, and then we list the properties of the tweet. And we'll get in further to this graph data model of Weaviate and more of what you can do with this. But here's the, the very basic of uh, defining the property that has the text of the tweet. And then say you have the author, which is another text. And you would add the impressions, engagements, so on as you fill out this dictionary changing the data type to say number or boolean and so on and telling weva not to bother with vectorizing uh, text columns like author as we'll see later in the example we're going to add tweets not just for myself but other people not to jump ahead but we want to tell weva to only vectorize this particular column and we do that with this skip parameter in the text to vec uh, transformers module so here's a quick overview of the scheme in the python and uh, so what I did, and I think this is really interesting, is go from Google Collab Notebooks to the Weaviate cloud service. And there are many other ways to upload data into Weaviate, but I think this for data scientists is so accessible, the way that you have these, this Jupyter Notebook interface hosted on Google Collab, and then putting data into the Weaviate cloud service, all of this can just be done with very little real uh, <laughs> or, or challenging skills with respect to the engineering of setting up all these different cloud services, we can just kind of, with a few clicks, go from Google Collab to the WeVA cloud service to host this example. So with that said, with the Twitter data hosted on the WeVA cloud service, let's jump into the WeVA console and do some GraphQL queries on my tweets. The screen is showing the WeVA console that has my Twitter data in it. One useful way to quickly get a sense of this is to click on the schema button and see the schema of the data that this, uh, that this console is currently pointing to. So we see how we have uh, the tweet text property, uh, we have the author of the tweet, uh, we have what hour the tweet was sent, uh, we have all these properties that describe each tweet in the data set. So the first query we're going to do is to do the, the highlight of the thing, the semantic nearest neighbor search to concepts like natural language processing or computer vision. So to do this we use the uh, get syntax, uh, we pass in as argument the tweet class, and then to this, we pass in the argument of the near text search. So, so in near text, we pass as argument the particular query that we want to make. So in this case, and I'm sorry that you're watching me kind of remember how to do this, but in this argument, we pass in what we want to search for. So say natural language processing. And to kind of jump around in the tutorial a little bit, the next thing is going to be uh, getting tweets other than just my own. So in order to just search for my tweets from now. We're going to also add this where filter uh, where we add this argument path, uh, author being the property that we want to have this symbolic filter on with our return results, uh, operator equal, and then uh, value text, uh, my Twitter handle, which is C shorten 30. So from there, we have our uh, filter on the tweets, and then we tell it which uh, attributes of the tweets we want to see in the return list. So Let's see the tweet text itself to sanity check this thing. Uh, then we'll get the impressions. And then let's also say, see URL click. So, so this forms our uh, query in GraphQL in the WeVA console. So when we click search, it's going to find the nearest neighbors to natural language processing uh, that I've authored. And then, um, and then return also the tweet text itself, the number of impressions, and the URL clicks on the tweet. So we send that query. And uh, so we see the top result is Stack Overflow down, really looking forward to language models that can answer questions about Python. So pretty related. And I guess, so kind of looking through this, I think maybe the most interesting thing to quickly focus on would be to understand that it doesn't have to have the exact keyword match natural language processing. It can still kind of capture the semantics of that, even if it doesn't directly uh, ask for that. So to also kind of just search through this, we can try uh, WeVA podcast and see what's returned. In this case, a lot of the tweets do uh, say WeVA podcast directly. Uh, maybe we could do just deep learning broadly. But anyways, I think uh, from this, you get a sense of 
Uh, you can decide what you want to uh, return from the properties of the thing, of the um, class. You have this near text filter where you pass in the arguments through this interface, and you can add additional filters this way. In addition to the Weaviate console, we can also wrap up the GraphQL queries in a Python syntax to send these queries in Python, then access the nearest neighbors in Python to produce the visualizations of the impression splits based on, say, Weaviate podcast, Weaviate tutorials, and AI weekly update, or also, say, natural language processing, computer vision, again, the same kind of idea. So this is the syntax of looking at how we can wrap up this GraphQL query into a Python uh, API. So we have the dictionary, we have the concepts query, uh, we do the, the get query, we pass in the class name tweet, the attributes we want to see, tweet text, impressions, then we execute the search, and then we index the return data object. So from that return data object, we can put it into, say, uh, Seaborn Matplotlib to visualize a distribution of impressions based on these different filters, achieving this idea of segmenting our analytics based on what the tweet was actually about. So following this analysis of segmenting tweets based on semantic content and distance to queries like WeVA podcasts, WeVA tutorials, or topics, again, natural language processing, computer vision, here are some additional questions that I'm asking about exploring Twitter analytics with WeVA and seeing what else we can do. And I'll continue this discussion in the fifth section of this talk under research questions and discussions. So one question I wanted to ask is this concept of have I tweeted something like this before and trying to have some kind of uh, say pre-flight checklist before sending a tweet to get a sense of how tweets like this have performed in the past. So uh, this is just showing putting the exact same tweet into the semantic space and seeing the uh, return nearest neighbors just to get a quick sanity check of what this kind of thing looks like. But probably more interestingly than just have I tweeted something like this before it might be to ask you know who in my say network or in my particular industry like machine learning has tweeted something like this uh, recently. So in order to explore this question, I aggregated a list of people who've come on the WeVA podcast. Going through the WeVA podcast guests and going through their Twitter usernames to hit the Tweepy API and add their recent tweets into this database to have this semantic search to see what all these people are tweeting about and see if uh, they have similar interests to the thing that I'm interested in right now. So the first step in this was compiling the list of WeVA podcast guests Twitter usernames uh, then hitting the Tweepy API like this using the uh, keys you get from the Twitter API and then grabbing 100 of the most recent tweets from our, from our uh, I think, roughly 14 or 15 Weaviate podcast guests. So another interesting thing with Weaviate is uh, I can use this same schema, just populating the tweet text, the author, and the likes. Even though I don't have, say, the impressions or URL clicks data, I can still just populate these uh, properties and add it into our pretty flexible data schema. So now that we've added uh, these user, uh, the additional uh, Twitter users, let's see some GraphQL queries with semantic search. So we're back in the WeVA console, and this time we're going to be querying all of the WeVA podcast guests to see if anyone has been tweeting about the particular topic of generative art. So in, it's the same exact query from before. We just have the get filter, uh, tweet, and then we're, from the tweet we want to get the tweet text, and uh, let's say the author, and then we add our near text filter to it. Uh, like this, where we have concepts, and then generative art. Cool, so this is how we form our query, and then we send it, and now we're searching through all the authors on the WeVA podcast and seeing if they've been tweeting about this concept of generative art. So we see uh, Han Zhao has been tweeting a bit, generative art is a creative process. Uh, we see a lot of, say, exact keyword matching. Uh, we see some AI generated artworks that isn't exactly identical to our key phrase, but it still pro props it up to one of the top uh, results. Uh, we see Bob tweeting uh, generative models like Dolly for music are around the corner. So generative music art. So anyway, so this is the idea where we can, you know, have these semantic searches. We can add a bunch of authors from uh, tw Twitter users and use this in order to do the semantic search about what people are tweeting about, which I think could be a really interesting tool and I'm really excited to continue exploring this application. If you're interested in playing with Weaviate yourself and sending some queries out, we have a live demo of Wikipedia that you can explore. So before diving into the uh, console itself with the Wikipedia data, let's look at the schema for this Wikipedia example. So there's one key thing that I've left out of the Twitter tutorial that is one of the most exciting parts of Weaviate generally, which is the graph-like data model. 
So in the Wikipedia example, we have articles and then we have paragraphs of the articles in the articles as two separate classes. So the article has the property of the title of the article, say Miami Heat to reference the example from earlier. And then each paragraph in the article is represented as a separate class that has the title of the um, article, I believe, and then the content in the paragraph itself and then the order that it appears in the Wikipedia article. So for example, coming back to uh, the positive sampling with the Miami Heat articles, this would be the first order because this is the first paragraph in this uh, article about the Miami Heat and then this is the uh, second paragraph in that particular article. So this allows us to create these relations, have uh, named relations between objects, and also we see this recursive relation where say uh, the, the Miami Heat article links to the NBA and then we have this recursive relation back to the NBA article. So I'm going to get into more on this in a little bit about how we could expand the Twitter example to have this graph-like uh, data model and, and introduce some additional classes. But let's get into the Wikipedia example to have a quick sense of this in action. So here we are in the WeVA console for the Wikipedia example. We can check the schema, see the classes. We have the article, a Wikipedia article with a title and uh, cross-references. Uh, and then we also have the paragraph, which is the Wikipedia paragraph. And within that, we have the content, which is the thing that is vectorized with the transformers. So uh, this is an automatically populated query from the web link that's in the description of this video to check out this uh, Wikipedia example. And so we're introducing a couple of new things from the Twitter example. So firstly, in addition to the near text filter, there's also a question answering uh, filter in Weaviate. And I think it's kind of out of the scope of this topic of this talk to completely dive into what question answering is. But basically what it's going to do is it's going to retrieve the nearest neighbor content to the question. And then it's going to classify using a supervised learning model, classify the answer to this question within the content. But the other thing that we see is the cross reference between the paragraph and then in article and then the title. So this is how we do that cross reference to answer the question within Wikipedia of who was Stanley Kubrick. So to recap, Weaviate is a vector search database rather than a library such as Facebook's face or Noi from Spotify. This means that Weaviate has the approximate nearest neighbor search for doing vector search with an absolutely enormous collection of vectors, but it also has database functionality like create, read, update, delete support, and lets you safely secure and persist your vectors, which is pretty important when you have a massive amount of vectors. And then we saw how Weaviate has a graph-like data model. Uh, we saw the example with Wikipedia of how you can use the graph data model to organize data in this way. We can imagine building on the Twitter example by say also linking these images by having a has image thing. And it's generally such an interesting property of a way of combining say multimodal text image data, but also kind of heterogeneous data. Say we have a tweet and it links to an article and then we have an article, which is also text, but we have this other way of representing that article object. So if you want to get started with Weaviate, I highly recommend checking out the uh, quick start guide under Weaviate. If you want to get started running with a demo data set and understanding how to set this up and eventually graduating to uploading your own data sets into Weaviate. So to summarize the fourth key section on using Weaviate for Twitter analytics, we see how returning to the whole theme of the talk, we can segment the impressions on Twitter based on the content of the tweet without manual labeling. We can do it with these vector representations that we get from a pre-trained sentence transformer that hasn't been, say, optimized on my tweets or really Twitter in general. Uh, and then further, we saw Weaviate, a vector search database, and we saw how we can use it to store and search through semantic vector embeddings of data. The fifth section presents some research questions we're exploring and a discussion around this project. So here are three important research questions and general directions that we're exploring that will help with projects like this and this general idea of vector search, and then also their applications and things like segmentation as outlined in the presentation. So the first key question is, should I fine tune my embedding model or my model that produces the vector representations. So early in the presentation, I, I claim that no, you don't need to. You can use these pre-trained sentence transformer models, but this is still a pretty active area of research. We, we do see a very impressive zero shot uh, generalization from these models, and it, it probably can give you a pretty good retrieval from your data, but there are all sorts of things that are in the works, uh, say sparse fine tuning that let you fine tune more efficiently. Uh, the continued development of these off-the-shelf models, of course, and then say hybrid approaches where we combine this uh, vector model with say uh, the keyword BM25, TFIDF, those kinds of features is pretty particular to text that particular approach, but 
this kind of fusion of features is is seeing a lot of interest in how we produce the retrieval list and combining the features from the vectors and then also this BM25 algorithm. So there is a very active line of research in just understanding contrastive learning generally. I don't think contrastive learning is a, uh, it it's kind of seems like a newer thing that's emerging. We say in computer vision, we had SimCLR, MoCo, and people started really taking that show on the road to text as well. And we're seeing things like sentence transformers. So I still think there's a lot of opportunities to explore how we train these models that are trained to produce vector representations. The second key thing is this idea around large scale vector search and how we form the, the how we do this vector search at the say billion scale. So imagine we have billions of tweets in our database and that's where these things called approximate nearest neighbor ANN algorithms come into play. And I think this is a really fascinating area of research to study, particularly if you're interested in things like data structures and computer science. And then finally, the key topic that I really want to emphasize and is I think very relevant to this particular project of Twitter analytics is how does vector search differ from classification or regression models and this idea of retrieval augmented, say, learning. So let's start with this idea of vector search versus regression on impressions. So imagine we have a model where you type in a tweet and then it will use your data to just predict how many impressions this tweet would receive. I mean, if, if it has high accuracy, you'd be like, well, sure, this, this is useful, I suppose. And then you tweak your, you craft your tweet modify some phrases until you can get this number to be as high as possible. But instead of just having this blind regression model, we might want to have a vector search model where, again, we put in our tweet and then we get the nearest neighbors to tweets we've sent before to give us this sense of what is this tweet I'm about to send similar to. But what retrieval augmented classification is about is combining both of these things. So the model is going to retrieve the nearest neighbor tweets in the input as it makes a prediction on how many impressions this individual tweet will receive. Then we have options where we could say perturb the input to have that interpretability and see how uh, a perceived change in nearest neighbors would change the impression prediction. And overall, it just gives us more of an interface to see what is influencing this prediction. Why is it predicting this amount of repression impressions rather than just this kind of blind input output mapping. So to continue on this discussion, this talk was inspired by the Twitter analytics data and trying to see what kinds of insights we can mine from it and how these new tools in vector search can help us gain additional insights from our Twitter analytics data as well as maybe also connecting to the broader scope of what everyone's tweeting about and because you can still access say the like retweet count which can also help you get a sense of performance with tweeting about these kinds of topics so generally we want to ask questions like you know should I post this to begin with would this be you know would this just be a bad tweet to post and save yourself the embarrassment sort of when you do that kind of thing and just generally thinking well maybe it's a good tweet but there's just a particular time to post it coming back to the symbolic questions but then kind of this entanglement of the tweet itself what time is best to post this particular tweet and then you know the phrasing it's this entanglement between the symbolic attributes of the time to post it as well as the kind of the content itself if you want to dig deeper into that and then we want to maybe expand from individual analysis to team analysis and say you know, how our aggregating the data from our entire team is anyone tweeted like something like this recently, who on our team would be best fit, fit to tell the story, and what topics should we be tweeting about is say a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these content strategies have a few different topics that they could explore and should, is it maybe time to double down on a particular thing, like say, uh, fine tuning retrieval models or ANN benchmarks, all these topics, which ones should we be tweeting about? So these are some of the questions that I was seeking to explore in this Twitter project, and I hope you found this interesting. So to summarize, the general idea is how can we improve these systems and what looks promising with respect to the particular ideas of improving these systems, say ideas like fine tuning, more approximate nearest neighbor research to understand how we can do this at larger scales, and this general idea of retrieval augmented modeling. To summarize this talk on vector search for data scientists, we first looked at the idea of segmentation in data science how we can split metrics like impressions based on values of different attributes, like what time the tweet was posted or whether it has a URL in it, in order to see the distributions and see the differences in distributions based on these values. Then we saw this idea of vector representations of data and how we can uh, represent, say, text, images, and code with vectors. And then in the third section on vector segmentation, uh, hopefully the additional examples made it a little more clear how we can combine these ideas of vector representations and then uh, segmenting our analytics based on the, the content of the data itself. Finally, we looked at the Weaviate example for Twitter analytics. I really hope you found this interesting. 
And then finally, we explored some research questions and discussion around this idea of vector search for data science, as well as this application for social media analytics. If you're interested in Weviate and these ideas around vector search, please connect with us on the Weviate Slack channel or our YouTube channel, Weviate Vector Search Engine. Uh, on the YouTube channel, as well as Spotify, I'm the host of the Weviate podcast, where we have a lot of interesting guests who are doing things and research around vector search or building applications with Weviate. And I really enjoy these conversations, so I hope you do as well. And finally, you can check us out on Twitter at weviate.io. Finally, I would like to give a special thank you to Sebastian Wittelek in advising and counseling the development of this presentation, as well as Svetlana Smolinova for the help with the visual styling. I'm so grateful for this help and putting this together, and it really means a lot to me. And in addition to everyone currently watching this video, thank you so much for watching the presentation. I really hope it made a compelling argument about vector search for data science and this idea of vector segmentation. And hopefully this Twitter analytics project was somewhat of an interesting way to understand this concept. So thanks again.